This is part one of Timothy O'Connor's views on religious diversity. How should we respond to the fact that there are many different beliefs concerning different religions across the world? And we're looking at the possibility of taking the view of pluralism or exclusivism. Timothy O'Connor spoke on this topic in the Mary Olive Woods lecture at Western Illinois University in 2018. And so some of the ideas I might be including from, came from that lecture as well. Now, O'Connor uh, has this take on what, he, what might be called the relativist position on religion or the pluralist view. And just to have a little background here, the fact that we have a lot of religious diversity in the world today, and that is continuing to increase, it seems like, as a result of that, the differences among the religions themselves are increasingly downplayed. They're considered to be less important. And there are actually really good reasons to reject this view of pluralism. But O'Connor's main aim is uh, more defensive, and so we'll see how that, that goes as we talk through some of the ideas here in part one. Um, people generally are not that committed to pluralism, actually, they, because they haven't thought it through that carefully. But they are committed to rejecting absolutist or exclusivist view. So O'Connor starts by considering reasons to reject exclusivism. And it is a popular view among those who aren't necessarily philosophers. Um, and this is due to a general lack of inclination to take any position on religion. Agnosticism has never been so popular as it is today. And it might be acceptable, for example, to say that Jesus is a way to God, but it's not acceptable to say that Jesus is the only way to God. This seems to be an increasingly common idea, one expressed well by Oprah Winfrey. And so this is a, a quote, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe that there is only one way. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to what you call, and of course in quotes, God. And so Oprah is one who has incredible influence over millions of people. And this was a statement from almost 20 years ago. And uh, this is a very popular view and becoming more popular with time. O'Connor's overall goal is to identify the underlying assumptions for rejecting exclusivism and show that they are real actually unreasonable. So the pluralist holds that religious beliefs are very different kinds of beliefs from the other beliefs that we have. The pluralist says that uh, we, when it comes to religious beliefs, these are different from the beliefs we have about really common things. Like we, we generally think it's simply true that there are buildings and baseballs and birds, and these buildings and baseballs and birds have particular characteristics. Baseballs and birds are smaller than buildings, for example. Um, and we are exclusivist about these things. If somebody thinks that baseballs are generally larger than buildings, they are mistaken, right? We are exclusivist. We reject that view. And the one who denies that birds exist is just simply wrong. So why is it though that when it comes to religious beliefs, we are not exclusivists? Well, what O'Connor does is he takes this in two stages. In, in the first stage, he considers the main pluralist argument against exclusivist Christian beliefs in particular, because O'Connor is a Christian, so that's the, the view, the approach that he's coming from. And he's looking at that argument and arguing that it fails. And the second 
stage is then uh, to consider the main arguments in favor of the most plausible version of pluralism and then show why those also fail. So first, objections to Christian exclusivism. Now, even though we're talking about this from a particular Christian belief set, this can apply for many of the things that O'Connor is talking about to other world religions as well. So it just with appropriate modifications, of course, particular to the religion, it will also apply to Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, and Islam, as well as Christianity. So here's one of the objections to exclusivism. It, O'Connor calls this the no differences in spiritual fruits objection. So you get the idea that when you look at the people in who participate in these various religions and you consider their spiritual fruits, their, their virtues maybe against their vices, they seem to be roughly similar across various religions. But O'Connor in particular, of course, uh, with his Christian background says that he, he describes experiencing what seemed to him as God's love for him, giving him reason to believe that there's a personal, loving creator. But of course, that's incompatible with Brahman, that is impersonal. And it seems that religious experiences have no uniformity in the reality that they purport to show. If everyone had the same experiences, then it would be plausible to accept the metaphysical claims that go along with the various, the similar rather experiences, right? If everybody had religious experiences that were the same, that they were all personal and none impersonal, for example, then we would accept the idea that whatever the ultimate reality is, it is personal. But the various attributes of divine reality expressed by differing religions and religious experiences are incompatible. So it's reasoned O'Connor is being arbitrary in claiming that there really is a personal loving God. Of course, he believes that, as do I. And the idea that there's a personal loving God who's omnipotent and omniscient seems to be arbitrary in light of these other religious beliefs that are out there. Pluralists argue that the attributes of ultimate reality vary according to particular cultures, but no specific packaging is necessary as long as one matures along their spiritual path, as long as they are transforming themselves, as Hick might say, to become reality-centered rather than self-centered. And some claim that some religions, for example, Buddhism, uh, are more in agreement with pluralism than other religious traditions. So I said that you could apply these ideas of exclusivism to any of the world religions, but some say, well, wait a minute. You gotta, when you think about Buddhism, it seems to be more broad and accepting of other religions. And so we'll take a look at that more carefully. It seems to have a slight advantage. It seems to fit in with pluralism more so than exclusivism. And why would we say that? Uh, let's consider Tibetan Buddhism. So O'Connor describes uh, seeing the Dalai Lama, hearing him speak, and it seems to be pluralistic when the Dalai Lama says things such as uh, Christians who find their faith leads them to act compassionately should continue in their faith. This is the kind of thing that is taught in Tibetan Buddhism. So it looks like, of course, that Buddhism is pluralistic, encouraging people who are Christians to continue in their Christian faith. But the actual tradition of Tibetan Buddhism affirms that its own doctrine is essential. The Buddhist doctrine is essential. Right? Salvation comes only when one realizes the truth of sunyata, for example. The, the idea that the world around us is radically illusory. 
That's what salvation is about, and that applies to everyone, even those who have different beliefs about salvation. So the problem is, according to this perspective, the Buddhist perspective, is not everyone's ready to accept this teaching. And acts of compassion, then, are going to help in the stages of rebirth. Right? In this life, if you are a practicing Christian and you are becoming more compassionate, that will help you get to the point of recognizing the truth, maybe not in this life, but maybe in the next life or the one after that. And that will ultimately lead to salvation. The salvation as described in Buddhism, right? And that's why the Dalai Lama can say that once you continue in their Christianity, it's an early step along the path that can lead to the fuller understanding of Buddhism. So when you look carefully even at Buddhism, that seems to be very pluralistic in nature, it is actually exclusivist, right? Salvation isn't through Jesus. Salvation is through recognizing the truth of sunyata. And so we can conclude that pluralism is at odds with most religions. We take the example of the most pluralistic type of religion, Tibetan Buddhism. We see that it is actually exclusivist. It's not hard to see how other religions are also exclusivist with their orthodox claims, at least. So pluralism is not only at odds with Christianity or Islam, which it's fairly easy to see why they would be exclusivist, but it's at odds with the Eastern traditions as well, with Hinduism and Buddhism. And upon close inspection, when you, when you look at the beliefs of the various religions, all major religions, and most of the minor ones for that matter, are exclusivist. So finding some similarity in, among spiritual fruits certainly doesn't mean that there's similarity in theological and metaphysical claims that are contradictory. So we need to separate this concern about no difference in spiritual fruits. That should not lead us to think that there's no difference in the metaphysical claims and the ultimate metaphysical basis for any given religion. So in, in truth, in all traditions, in all world religions, there are a few saints, others with no discernible change, no difference, and many somewhere in between. But that does not support pluralism, right? So differences among spiritual fruits, or rather the lack thereof, does not really support pluralism. So that motive for pluralism is undermined and does not give you sufficient justification to think that pluralism is correct. Now there is another argument that we'll consider here in, in part one about arrogance. And it goes something like this, believing that one's own religious beliefs are true, while so many others have false belief about religion, is arrogant. Again, this is very common, very popular idea. How can one say that, if from O'Connor's view, that Jesus is the only way to God and salvation comes through forgiveness of sins that comes through the cross? And other religions are false when they teach that you can be saved or fulfilled in other ways. But this is arrogance, the charge claims. It's to claim intellectual and moral superiority to take a view such as this. And again, this is, it actually turns out to be the view of most proponents, believers in the various religious traditions, that their own tradition is true, others are false. So how do you respond to this? O'Connor agrees that certainly there are many people in the church who are arrogant. Right? That's definitely the case. Maybe I'm one of them. But proportionally, it doesn't seem to be any more 
arrogance inside the church than outside the church. Arrogance isn't a, an inevitable consequence of exclusivist belief. In fact, uh, there are many exclusivists in the church who are genuinely humble. In fact, humility is a virtue espoused in the church, and it's acknowledged that even faith is a gift from God. So no one has reason to boast. No one has reason to claim that it's their intellect or works that put them on the right side of the, the issue with God. So let's look more carefully at the principle that the pluralist might use for making this argument. O'Connor suggests the following. For any belief of yours, once you become aware, A, that others disagree with it, and B, that you have no argument on its behalf that's likely to convince all or most of the reasonable, good-intentioned people who disagree with you, then it would be arrogant of you to continue holding that belief. This, if one reflects carefully on the pluralist position and the charge of arrogance, seems to be the principle that it's based on and why you should not be an exclusivist. Some principle like this. But here's the problem. The pluralist is also making an exclusivist claim about religion. Now, albeit it is one level up, one level higher, uh, but notice there is clearly this disagreement between the pluralist and exclusivist. Now, are they arrogant for thinking they are correct about religion when the vast majority of others are in disagreement, the vast majority of religious believers being exclusivist. So look, in other words, the pluralist, if they're going to hold to this arrogance principle, they're going to be ho hoisted on their own petard, right? If, if Because other people disagree with them, A, and they don't have arguments on their behalf that's going to convince the reasonable, good intentioned people who disagree with them, for example, O'Connor, for example, Peter Van Inwagen, right? So if they're claiming that it's arrogant to be an exclusivist, their principle that underlies that claim would have to apply to themselves in being pluralist. And so uh, again, uh, arrogance is uh, certainly something that might be present on, in anyone. Uh, with any religion and any position on this pluralism exclusivism debate, but that doesn't really settle the issue. It's, it's not a reason to give up exclusivism. Now in part two, uh, we'll consider some other objections and more carefully examine exclusivism and some reasons to reject pluralism.